a historical sketch of and introduction to the origin of species by means of natural selection by charles darwin this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org your reader michael armenta the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life by charles darwin master of arts fellow of the royal society author of the descent of man etc etc sixth london edition with all additions and corrections Quote, but with regard to the material world we can at least go so far as this we can perceive that events are brought about not by insulated interpositions of divine power exerted in each particular case but by the establishment of general laws end quote Whewell, bridgewater treatise quote, the only distinct meaning of the word natural is stated fixed or settled since what is natural as much requires and presupposes an intelligent agent to render it so i e to effect it continually or at stated times as what is supernatural or miraculous does to effect it for once butler analogy of revealed religion quote, to conclude therefore let no man out of a weak conceit of sobriety or an ill-applied moderation think or maintain that a man can search too far or be too well studied in the book of god's word or in the book of god's works divinity or philosophy but rather let men endeavour an endless progress or proficience in both End quote. bacon advancement of learning an historical sketch of the progress of opinion on the origin of species previously to the publication of the first edition of this work i will here give a brief sketch of the progress of opinion on the origin of species until recently the great majority of naturalists believed that species were immutable productions and had been separately created this view has been ably maintained by many authors some few naturalists on the other hand have believed that species undergo modification and that the existing forms of life are the descendants by true generation of pre-existing forms passing over allusions to the subject in the classical writers after remarking that rain does not fall in order to make the corn grow any more than it falls to spoil the farmer's corn when threshed out of doors applies the same argument to organization and adds quote, so what hinders the different parts of the body from having this merely accidental relation in nature as the teeth for example grow by necessity the front ones sharp adapted for dividing and the grinders flat and serviceable for masticating the food since they were not made for the sake of this but it was the result of accident and in like manner as to other parts in which there appears to exist an adaptation to an end wheresoever therefore all things together that is all the parts of one whole happened like as if they were made for the sake of something these were preserved having been appropriately constituted by an internal spontaneity and whatsoever things were not thus constituted perish and still perish End quote. we see here the principle of natural selection shadowed forth but how little aristotle fully comprehended the principle is shown by his remarks on the formation of the teeth the first author who in modern times has treated it in a scientific spirit was buffon but as his opinions fluctuated greatly at different periods 
and as he does not enter on the causes or means of the transformation of species, I need not here enter on details. Lamarck was the first man whose conclusions on the subject excited much attention. This justly celebrated naturalist first published his views in 1801. He much enlarged them in 1809 in his Philosophie Zoologique, and subsequently, 1815, in the introduction to his Historie Naturelle des Animaux en Vertebrats. In these works, he upholds the doctrine that all species, including man, are descended from other species. He first did the eminent service of arousing attention to the probability of all change in the organic, as well as in the inorganic world, being the result of law and not of miraculous interposition. Lamarck seems to have been chiefly led to his conclusion on the gradual change of species by the difficulty of distinguishing species and varieties, by the almost perfect gradation of forms in certain groups, and by the analogy of domestic productions. With respect to the means of modification, he attributed something to the direct action of the physical conditions of life, something to the crossing of already existing forms, and much to use and disuse, that is, to the effects of habit, to this latter agency he seems to attribute all the beautiful adaptations in nature such as the long neck of the giraffe for browsing on the branches of trees but he likewise believed in a law of progressive development and as all the forms of life thus tend to progress in order to account for the existence of the present day of simple productions he maintains that such forms are now spontaneously generated I have taken the date of the first publication of Lamarck from Isidore and Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire's excellent history of opinion on this subject. In this work, a full account is given of Buffon's conclusions on the same subject. It is curious how largely my grandfather, Dr. Erasmus Darwin, anticipated the views and erroneous grounds of opinion of Lamarck in his Zoonomia, published in 1794. According to Isidre Geoffroy, there is no doubt that Goethe was an extreme partisan of similar views, as shown in the introduction to a work written in 1794 and 1795, but not published till long afterward. He has pointedly remarked that the future question for naturalists will be how, for instance, cattle got to their horns, and not for what they are used. It is rather a singular instance of the manner in which similar views arise at about the same time, that Goethe in Germany, Dr. Darwin in England, and Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire, as we will immediately see, in France, came to the same conclusion on the origin of species in the year 1794-5. to Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire, as is stated in his Life, written by his son, suspected as early as 1795 that what we call species are various degenerations of the same type. It was not until 1828 that he published his conviction that the same forms have not been perpetuated since the origin of all things. Geoffroy seems to have relied chiefly on the conditions of life, or the mon ambiant, as the cause of change. He was cautious in drawing conclusions and did not believe that existing species are now undergoing modification. And, as his son adds, quote, C'est donc un problème à réserver entièrement à l'avenir. Suppose même qu'à l'avenir doit avoir brise sur lui. In 1813, Dr. W. C. Wells read before the Royal Society an account of a white female, part of whose skin resembles that of a negro, but his paper was not published until his famous Two Essays Upon Dew and Single Vision appeared in 1818. In this paper he distinctly recognizes the principle of natural selection, and this is the first recognition which has been indicated. But he applies it only to the races of man, and to certain characters alone. After remarking that Negroes and Mulattoes enjoy an immunity from certain tropical diseases, he observes, firstly, 
that all animals tend to vary in some degree, and, secondly, that agriculturists improve their domesticated animals by selection. And then he adds, but what is done in this latter case, quote, by art, seems to be done with equal efficacy, though more slowly, by nature, in the formation of varieties of mankind fitted for the country which they inhabit. Of the accidental varieties of man, which would occur among the first few, and scattered inhabitants of the middle regions of Africa, some would be better fitted than others to bear the diseases of the country. This race would consequently multiply, while the others would decrease, not only from their inability to sustain the attacks of disease, but from their incapacity of contending with their more vigorous neighbors. The color of this vigorous race, I take for granted, from what has been already said, would be dark, but the same disposition to form varieties still existing, a darker and a darker race would in the course of time occur, and as the darkest would be the best fitted for the climate, this would at length become the most prevalent, if not the only race, in the particular country in which it had originated. End quote. He then extends these same views to the white inhabitants of colder climates, I am indebted to Mr. Rowley of the United States for having called my attention, through Mr. Brace, to the above passage of Dr. Wells' work. The Honorable and Reverend W. Herbert, afterward Dean of Manchester, in the fourth volume of the Horticultural Transactions, 1822, and in his work on the Amaryllidaceae, declares that, quote, Horticultural experiments have established beyond the possibility of refutation, that botanical species are only a higher and more permanent class of varieties. End quote. He extends the same view to animals. The dean believes that single species of each genus were created in an organically highly plastic condition, and that these have produced, chiefly by intercrossing, but likewise by variation, all our existing species. In 1826, Professor Grant, in the concluding paragraph in his well-known paper on the Spongilla, clearly declares his belief that species are descended from other species, and that they become improved in the course of modification. This same view was given in his 55th lecture, published in The Lancet in 1834. In 1831, Mr. Patrick Matthew published his work on Naval Timber and Arboriculture, in which he gives precisely the same view on the origin of species as that, presently to be alluded to, propounded by Mr. Wallace and myself in the Linnaean Journal, and as that enlarged in the present volume. Unfortunately, the view was given by Mr. Matthew very briefly in scattered passages in an appendix to a work on a different subject, so that it remained unnoticed until Mr. Matthew himself drew attention to it in the Gardener's Chronicle on April 7, 1860. The differences of Mr. Matthew's views from mine are not of much importance. He seems to consider that the world was nearly depopulated at successive periods, and then restocked, and he gives as an alternative that new forms may be generated, quote, without the presence of any mould or germ of former aggregates, end quote. I am not sure that I understand some passages, but it seems that he attributes much influence to the direct action of the conditions of life. He clearly saw, however, the full force of the principle of natural selection, the celebrated geologist and naturalist, von Buch, in his excellent Description Physique des Asleucanaries, clearly expresses his belief that varieties slowly become changed into permanent species, which are no longer capable of intercrossing. Raffinesque, in his New Flora of North America, published in 1836, wrote as follows, quote, all species might have been varieties once, 
and many varieties are gradually becoming species by assuming constant and peculiar characters End quote. but further on he adds quote, except the original types or ancestors of the genus End quote. in eighteen forty three forty four professor haldman has ably given the arguments for and against the hypothesis of the development and modification of species he seems to lean toward the side of change the vestiges of creation appeared in eighteen forty four in the tenth and much improved edition the anonymous author says quote, the proposition determined on after much consideration is that the several series of animated beings from the simplest and oldest up to the highest and most recent are under the providence of god the results first of an impulse which has been imparted to the forms of life advancing them in definite times by generation through grades of organization terminating in the highest dicotyledons and vertebrata these grades being few in number and generally marked by intervals of organic character which we find to be a practical difficulty in ascertaining affinities second of another impulse connected with the vital forces tending in the course of generations to modify organic structures in accordance with external circumstances as food the nature of the habitat and the meteoric agencies these being the adaptations of the natural theologian End quote. the author apparently believes that organization progresses by sudden leaps but that the effects produced by the conditions of life are gradual he argues with much force on general grounds that species are not immutable productions but i cannot see how the two supposed impulses account in a scientific sense for the numerous and beautiful co-adaptation which we see throughout nature i cannot see that we thus gain any insight how for instance a woodpecker had become adapted to its peculiar habits of life the work from its powerful and brilliant style though displaying in the early editions little accurate knowledge and a great want of scientific caution immediately had a very wide circulation in my opinion it has done excellent service in this country in calling attention to the subject in removing prejudice and in thus preparing the ground for the reception of analogous views in eighteen forty six the veteran geologist m j amalieu de roy published in an excellent though short paper his opinion that it is more probable that new species have been produced by descent with modification than that they have been separately created the author first promulgated this opinion in eighteen thirty one professor owen in eighteen forty nine wrote as follows quote, the archetypal idea was manifested in the flesh under diverse such modifications upon this planet long prior to the existence of those animal species that actually exemplify it to what natural laws or secondary causes the orderly succession and progression of such organic phenomena may have been committed we as yet are ignorant End quote. in his address to the british association in eighteen fifty eight he speaks of quote, the axiom of the continuous operation of creative power or of the ordained becoming of living things End quote. further on after referring to geographical distribution he adds quote, these phenomena shake our confidence in the conclusion that the apteryx of new zealand and the red grouse of england were distinct creations in and for those islands respectively always also it may be well to bear in mind that by the word quote, creation end quote, the zoologist means quote, a process he knows not what end quote. he amplifies this idea by adding that when such cases as that of the red grouse are quote, 
enumerated by the zoologist as evidence of distinct creation of the bird in and for such islands he chiefly expresses that he knows not how the red grouse came to be there and there exclusively signifying also by this mode of expressing such ignorance his belief both that the bird and the islands owed their origin to a great first creative cause End quote. if we interpret these sentences given in the same address one by the other it appears that this eminent philosopher felt in eighteen fifty eight his confidence shaken that the apteryx and the red grouse first appeared in their respective homes quote, he knew not how end quote, or by some process quote, he knew not what end quote. this address was delivered after the papers by mr wallace and myself on the origin of species presently to be referred to had been read before the linnean society when the first edition of this work was published i was so completely deceived as were many others, by such expressions as, quote, the continuous operation of creative power, end quote, that I included Professor Owen with other paleontologists as being firmly convinced of the immutability of species. But it appears that this was on my part a preposterous error. In the last edition of this work, I inferred, and the inference still seems to me perfectly just, from a passage beginning with the words, quote, no doubt the type form, end quote, etc., that Professor Owen admitted that natural selection may have done something in the formation of a new species, but this, it appears, is inaccurate and without evidence. I also gave some extracts from a correspondence between Professor Owen and the editor of the London Review, from which it appeared manifest to the editor, as well as to myself, that Professor Owen claimed to have promulgated the theory of natural selection before I had done so, and I expressed my surprise and satisfaction at this announcement. But as far as it is possible to understand certain recently published passages, I have either partially or wholly again fallen into error. It is consolatory to me that others find Professor Owens's controversial writings as difficult to understand and to reconcile with each other as I do. As far as the mere enunciation of the principle of natural selection is concerned, it is quite immaterial whether or not Professor Owen preceded me, for both of us, as shown in this historical sketch, were long ago preceded by Dr. Wells and Mr. Matthews, Monsieur is Edouard of France Saint Hilaire, in his lectures delivered in eighteen fifty, briefly gives his reason for believing that specific characters quote, sont fixes pour chaque espèce en que se perpetue en milieu des mêmes circonstances. Il se modifie si les circonstances ambiantes viennent changer. En résume, l'observation des animaux sauvages demande déjà la variabilité limitée des espèces. Les expériences sur les animaux sauvages devenus domestiques et sur les animaux domestiques redevenus sauvages. La demande plus clairement encore. Ces mêmes expériences prouvent plus que les différences produites peuvent être de valeur générique. End quote. In his Historie naturelle générale, he amplifies analogous conclusions. From a circular lately issued, it appears that Dr. Frank, in 1851, propounded the doctrine that all organic beings have descended from one primordial form. His grounds of belief and treatment of the subject are wholly different from mine, but as Dr. Frake has now, 1861, published his essay on the origin of species by means of organic affinity, the difficult attempt to give any idea of his views would be superfluous on my part. Mr. Herbert Spencer, in an essay, originally published in The Leader, March 1852, and republished in his Essays in 1858, has contrasted the theories of the creation and the development of organic beings with remarkable skill and force. He argues from the analogy of domestic productions, from the changes which the embryos of many species undergo, from the difficulty of distinguishing species and varieties, 
and from the principle of general gradation that species have been modified and he attributes the modification to the change of circumstances the author eighteen fifty five has also treated psychology on the principle of the necessary acquirement of each mental power and capacity by gradation in eighteen fifty two m nowden a distinguished botanist expressly stated in an admirable paper on the origin of species his belief that species are formed in an analogous manner as varieties are under cultivation and the latter process he attributes to man's power of selection but he does not show how selection acts under nature he believes like dean herbert that species when nascent were more plastic than at present he lays weight on what he calls the principle of finality quote, Poussons mysterieux subdetermine fédalite par les autres volants trop vidondiers dont l'action se sent sur les êtres vivants détermine à toutes les époques de l'existence du monde la forme, le volume et la durée de chacun d'eux en raison de sa destinée, l'ordre des choses dont il fait partie. C'est cette puissance qui harmonise chaque membre de l'ensemble en l'appropriant à la fonction qui doit remplir dans l'organisme général de la nature, fonction qui est pour lui son raison d'être. From references in Bronze, Untersuchungen über die Entwicklungsgesetze, it appears that the celebrated botanist and paleontologist Unger published in eighteen fifty two his belief that species undergo development and modification dalton likewise in de pander and dalton's work on fossil sloths expressed in eighteen twenty one a similar belief similar views have as is well known been maintained by oaken in his mystical nature philosophie from other references in godron's work sous l'espèce it seems that boris saint vincent burdac pure and fries have all admitted that new species are continually being produced i may add that of the thirty-four authors named in this historical sketch who believe in the modification of species or at least disbelieve in separate acts of creation twenty-seven have written on special branches of natural history or geology in eighteen fifty three a celebrated geologist count kaiserling suggested that as new diseases supposed to have been caused by some miasma have arisen and spread over the world so at certain periods the germs of existing species may have been chemically affected by circumambient molecules of a particular nature and thus have given rise to new forms in this same year, 1853, Dr. Schaffhausen published an excellent pamphlet in which he maintains the development of organic forms on the earth. He infers that many species have kept true for long periods, whereas a few have become modified. The distinction of species, he explains, by the destruction of intermediate graduated forms. Quote, thus living plants and animals are not separated from the extinct by new creations but are to be regarded as their descendants through continued reproduction a well-known french botanist m le Conc, writes in eighteen fifty four que la fixit la variation de l'espèce nous conduisent directement aux idées émises par durant justement célébrant Geoffrey saint hilaire et Goethe. Some other passages scattered through M. Lecoq's large work make it a little doubtful how far he extends his views on the modification of species. The quote, philosophy of creation end quote, has been treated in a masterly manner by the Reverend Baden Powell in his essays on the unity of worlds eighteen fifty five nothing can be more striking than the manner in which he shows that the introduction of new species is quote, a regular 
not a casual phenomenon, end quote. or, as Sir John Herschel expresses it, quote, a natural and contradistinction to a miraculous process, end quote. The third volume of the Journal of the Linnaean Society contains papers, read July 1, 1858, by Mr. Wallace and myself, in which, as stated in the introductory remarks to this volume, the theory of natural selection is promulgated by Mr. Wallace with admirable force and clearness. Von Baer, toward whom all zoologists feel so profound a respect, expressed, about the year 1859, his conviction, chiefly grounded on the laws of geographical distribution, that forms now perfectly distinct have descended from a single parent form. In June 1859, Professor Huxley gave a lecture before the Royal Institution on persistent types of animal life. Referring to such cases, he remarks, quote, It is difficult to comprehend the meaning of such facts as these, if we suppose that each species of animal and plant, or each great type of organization, was formed and placed upon the surface of the globe at long intervals by a distinct act of creative power and it is well to recollect that such an assumption is as unsupported by tradition or revelation as it is opposed to the general analogy of nature. If, on the other hand, we view persistent types in relation to that hypothesis which supposes the species living at any time to be the result of the gradual modification of pre-existing species, a hypothesis which, though unproven and sadly damaged, by some of its supporters, is yet the only one to which physiology lends any countenance. Their existence would seem to show that the amount of modification which living beings have undergone during a geological time is but very small in relation to the whole series of changes which they have suffered. End quote. In December 1859, Dr. Hooker published his Introduction to the Australian Flora. In the first part of this great work, he admits the truth of the descent and modification of species, and supports this doctrine by many original observations. The first edition of this work was published on November 24th, 1859, and the second edition on January 7th, 1816. Introduction when on board Her Majesty's ship Beagle, as naturalist, I was much struck with certain facts in the distribution of the organic beings inhabiting South America, and in the geological relations of the present to the past inhabitants of that continent. These facts, as will be seen in the latter chapters of this volume, seem to throw some light on the origin of species, that mystery of mysteries, as it has been called by one of our greatest philosophers. On my return home, it occurred to me, in 1837, that something might perhaps be made out on this question, by patiently accumulating and reflecting on all sorts of facts, which could possibly have any bearing on it. After five years' work, I allowed myself to speculate on the subject, and drew up some short notes. These I enlarged, in 1844, into a sketch of the conclusions, which then seemed to me probable. From that period to the present day, I have steadily pursued the same object. I hope that I may be excused for entering on these personal details, as I give them to show that I have not been hasty in coming to a decision. My work is now, 1859, nearly finished but as it will take me many more years to complete it, and as my health is far from strong, I have been urged to publish this abstract. I have more especially been induced to do this as Mr. Wallace, who is now studying the natural history of the Malay archipelago, has arrived at almost exactly the same general conclusions that I have on the origin of species. In 1858 he sent me a memoir on this subject, with a request that I would forward it to Sir Charles Lyell, who sent it to the Linnaean Society, and it is published in the third volume of the journal of that society. Sir C. Lyell and 
Dr. Hooker, who both knew of my work, the latter having read my sketch of 1844, honoured me by thinking it advisable to publish, with Mr. Wallace's excellent memoir, some brief extracts from my manuscripts. This abstract, which I now publish, must necessarily be imperfect. I cannot here give references and authorities for my several statements, and I must trust to the reader reposing some confidence in my accuracy. No doubt errors may have crept in, though I hope I have always been cautious in trusting to good authorities alone, give only the general conclusions at which I have arrived, with a few facts in illustration, but which, I hope, in most cases will suffice. No one can feel more sensible than I do of the necessity of hereafter publishing in detail all the facts with references on which my conclusions have been grounded, and I hope in a future work to do this, for I am well aware that scarcely a single point is discussed in this volume on which the facts cannot be adduced, often apparently leading to conclusions directly opposite to those at which I have arrived. A fair result can be obtained only by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each question, and this is here impossible. I much regret that want of space prevents my having the satisfaction of acknowledging the generous assistance which I have received from very many naturalists, some of them personally unknown to me. I cannot, however, let this opportunity pass without expressing my deep obligations to Dr. Hooker, who, for the last fifteen years, has aided me in every possible way by his large stores of knowledge and his excellent judgment. In considering the origin of species, it is quite conceivable that a naturalist, reflecting on the mutual affinities of organic beings, on their embryological relations, their geographical distribution, geological succession, and other such facts, might come to the conclusion that species had not been independently created, but had descended, like varieties, from other species. Nevertheless, such a conclusion, even if well-founded, would be unsatisfactory, until it could be shown how the innumerable species inhabiting this world have been modified so as to acquire that perfection of structure and co-adaptation which justly excites our admiration. Naturalists continually refer to external conditions, such as climate, food, etc., as the only possible cause of variation. In one limited sense, as we shall hereafter see, this may be true, but it is preposterous to attribute to mere external conditions the structure, for instance, of the woodpecker, with its feet, tail, beak, and tongue so admirably adapted to catch insects under the bark of trees. In the case of the mistletoe, which draws its nourishment from certain trees, which has seeds that must be transported by certain birds, and which has flowers with separate sexes, absolutely requiring the agency of certain insects to bring pollen from one flower to the other, it is equally preposterous to account for the structure of this parasite, with its relations to several distinct organic beings, by the effects of external conditions, or of habitat, or of the volition of the plant itself. It is therefore of the highest importance to gain a clear insight into the means of modification and co-adaptation. At the commencement of my observations, it seemed to me probable that a careful study of domesticated animals and of cultivated plants would offer the best chance of making out this obscure problem. Nor have I been disappointed. In this, and in all other perplexing cases, I have invariably found that our knowledge, imperfect though it be, of variation under domestication, afforded the best and safest clue. I may venture to express my conviction of the high values of such studies, although they have been very commonly neglected by naturalists. From these considerations, I shall devote the first chapter of this abstract to variation under domestication. We shall thus see that a large amount of hereditary modification is at least possible, and, what is equally or more important, we shall see how great is the power of man in accumulating, by his selection, 
successive slight variations. I will then pass on to the variability of species in a state of nature. But I shall unfortunately be compelled to treat this subject far too briefly, as it can be treated properly only by giving long catalogues of facts. We shall, however, be enabled to discuss what circumstances are most favorable to variation. In the next chapter, the struggle for existence among all organic beings throughout the world, which inevitably follows from the high geometrical ratio of their increase, will be considered. This is the doctrine of Malthus, applied to the whole animal and vegetable kingdoms, as many more individuals of each species are born than can possibly survive, and as, consequently, there is a frequently recurring struggle for existence, it follows that any being, if it vary, however slightly in any manner, profitable to itself, under the complex and sometimes varying conditions of life, will have a better chance of surviving, and thus be naturally selected, from the strong principle of inheritance, any selected variety will tend to propagate its new and modified form. This fundamental subject of natural selection will be treated at some length in the fourth chapter, and we shall then see how natural selection almost inevitably causes much extinction of the less improved forms of life, and leads to what I have called divergence of character. In the next chapter, I shall discuss the complex and little-known laws of variation. In the five succeeding chapters, the most apparent and gravest difficulties in accepting the theory will be given, namely, first, the difficulties of transitions, or how a simple being or a simple organ can be changed and perfected into a highly developed being or into an elaborately constructed organ. Secondly, the subject of interest or the mental powers of animals. Thirdly, hybridism, or the infertility of species, and the fertility of varieties when intercrossed. And fourthly, the imperfection of the geological record. In the next chapter, I shall consider the geological succession of organic beings throughout time. In the twelfth and thirteenth, their geographical distribution throughout space, in the fourteenth, their classification, or mutual affinities, both when mature and in an embryonic condition. In the last chapter, I shall give a brief recapitulation of the whole work, and a few concluding remarks. No one ought to feel surprise at much remaining as yet unexplained in regard to the origin of species and varieties, if he make due allowance for our profound ignorance in regard to the mutual relations of the many beings which live around us. Who can explain why one species ranges widely and is very numerous, and why another allied species has a narrow range and is rare? Yet these relations are of the highest importance, for they determine the present welfare and, as I believe, the future success and modification of every inhabitant of this world. Still less do we know of the mutual relations of the innumerable inhabitants of the world during the many past geological epochs in its history. Although much remains obscure, and it will long remain obscure, I can entertain, no doubt, after the most deliberate study and dispassionate judgment of which I am capable, that the view which most naturalists until recently entertained, and which I formerly entertained, namely, that each species has been independently created, is erroneous. I am fully convinced that species are not immutable, but that those belonging to what are called the same genera are lineal descendants of some other and generally extinct species, in the same manner as the acknowledged varieties of any one species are the descendants of that species. Furthermore, I am convinced that natural selection has been the most important, but not the exclusive, means of modification. End of A Historical Sketch and Introduction to The Origin of Species 